afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Jesse Kelly, and I'm the Government Affairs Manager for the Criminal Justice and Civil Liberties team at the R Street Institute. R Street is a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy research organization based in Washington, D.C. The Criminal Justice and Civil Liberties Policy Program includes research and commentary on public policy related to all stages of the justice system. We work across the ideological spectrum to provide policymakers with reforms that prioritize human dignity, public safety, due process, individual liberty, and fiscal responsibility. We believe that both research and reason demonstrate that the kids and teens are different from adults and as such must be treated by the criminal justice system. Ideally, we believe a juvenile justice system that prioritizes rehabilitation over retribution and seeks to guide young people along the pathway towards maturity by providing appropriate individualized services can be most successful. Today, our panelists will discuss the differences between youth and adults in the justice system, specifically diving into juvenile justice issues in Indiana. Our first panelist is Noah Bean. He's the Principal Associate for the Public Safety Performance Project with the Pew Charitable Trust. Pew's Public Safety Performance Project advances data-driven, research-based, and physically sound criminal and juvenile justice policies and practices that protect public safety, ensure accountability, control costs. In the past, Noah has worked with the Commission on Improving the Status of Children in Indiana. Also joining us today is Officer Floyd Peterson of the Washington Township School Police Department in Indianapolis. Officer Peterson began his law enforcement career in 2007 as a school police officer for the Indianapolis Public School System. For nine years, he kept students and school staff safe by developing crisis plans and implementing strategies to prevent criminal activity. He later served as campus police officer at the Marion University in Indianapolis, where he eventually became the director of tactical training and technology for the on-campus police department. In this role, he trained offices in active shooter, restorative justice, school safety, and survival tactics. Next, we have Josh Rogner, who is a Senior Advocate Associate at the Sentencing Project. Josh manages a portfolio of juvenile justice issues for the Sentencing Project, which includes the transfer of juveniles into the adult criminal system, juveniles sentenced to life without parole, and racial and ethnic disparities in the juvenile justice system. He's the author of several papers and fact sheets for the Sentencing Project, including how Tough on Crime Became Tough on Kids, Prosecuting Teenage Drug Charges in Adult Court, and Racial Disparities in Youth Commitments and Arrests. Most recently, Josh has undertaken a project to research and document the spread of the novel coronavirus within juvenile detention facilities and published Youth Justice Under the Coronavirus. Joel Winnicky is the Senior Staff Attorney with the Indiana Public Defender Council. Joel is a former law clerk, and he served as a contract public defender with the Putnam Circuit Court. He's also worked the state public defender's office. Joel served two terms as a board member of the Indiana Public Defender Council. Currently, he's serving as the post disposition unit coordinator for the Indiana Public Defender's Council Juvenile Defense Project. Our final panelist is not yet on your screen as she is finishing a docket, but she is Judge Marilyn Moores and serves the Marion County Superior Court Juvenile Division. She relieved her, received her law degree from Indiana University School of Law and was appointed to the bench in 2005. Prior to that, Judge Moores was a partner in an Indianapolis law firm where she concentrated on the areas of federal litigation, family law, governmental litigation, civil rights, and commercial matters. Our moderator for today is my colleague and friend, Emily Mooney. She's a criminal justice policy fellow at the R Street Institute. Emily conducts policy research and educational outreach on topics regarding juvenile justice, corrections, reentry, and policing. Prior to joining R Street, Emily conducted policy research and analysis on the impact of maternal incarceration for the National Criminal Justice Association, 
and the Louisiana Commission on Law Enforcement. Emily, I'll pass the torch to you and I'm eager to learn more from the experts on this incredible panel. Thanks, Jesse, for kicking us off here um, at, and for the introductions for the panelists. I wanna start us off kind of at the, the beginning of this issue and talking about how are kids different from adults and how should that affect how we respond to youth misbehavior? Um, and to kick us off, I'd really like Officer Floyd Peterson to describe some of his work um, with young people and, and how he approaches young people when thinking about this policy area. Thank you, Emily. Uh, I think the first thing we look at is uh, prevention and mitigation. And so in order to really deal with our youth, we have to understand police and the team bring uh, concepts. And we know most of our kids are not frontal lobe developed yet. So a lot of stuff they're really moving or decisions they're making is pretty much driven without even thinking about what they're doing and why they're doing it. Uh, so we tend to take those uh, concepts into, into consideration when we're dealing with the youth. And instead of always asking, look what you did, we ask why you've done what you've done. And so we kind of reframed how we're dealing with our youth. Uh, instead of being so punitive, uh, we're trying to be more restorative uh, to try to teach more character and, and, and values and a sense of moral values uh, to, our, to our students. Thank you. Noah, you and, and Pew has been involved in juvenile justice reform efforts across the nation. Um, how do you try to bring some of those youth development principles and knowledge of what's best for youth uh, into the policies you're seeking to promote? Thanks, Emily, and thanks everyone um, for being here on the call. Uh, like Emily said, our, our project um, is a nonpartisan organization that provides data and research assistance to states that want to look at these issues and decide for themselves what kinds of policies are gonna best protect public safety and get the best outcomes for youth. And so um, that's kind of a lot of what they ask of us is what, what are the most effective responses to youth behavior that are gonna reduce the likelihood of reoffending <clears throat> and also get better outcomes for kids. Um, overall, the research suggests that youth generally respond better to positive reinforcement rather than to more punitive um, interactions interactions, missions, or services, uh, those are the ones that are more likely to get you less public safety in the long run. So for example, there's a very strong research consensus that interventions uh, that remove youth from the home and put them in a congregate setting uh, do not lead to better outcomes for the safety of the community and for the youth themselves than interventions where youth remain in the home with their families. Uh, things like family therapy, mentoring, other types of services that uh, can be sort of what they call brand name uh, evidence-based interventions, but can also just be homegrown that adhere to some of those research principles about, about how best to work with youth, with their families, uh, and getting back on the right track. So I think overall, that's a lot of the thrust of, of the research that we've worked with states on, on uh, to implement in their laws. Now, something we often hear when we're working with legislators is, well, what about for the young people that have committed more serious or violent crimes? Um, there's a sense that, you know, a notion of retribution should mean, you know, we should hold them account accountable in maybe more severe ways with some folks advocating for their entrance into the adult criminal justice system. Um, Josh and Joel, uh, whoever wants to go first, you guys have worked a lot on the intersection of, of those issues of actually arguing that keeping kids out of the adult criminal justice system might be the better way to both hold the young person accountable and increase public safety. Could you speak a little bit about why that's the case? Yeah, you know, you're really asking two separate questions about what's best for the kid and what's best for the community. And, and I'm really happy to, to deal with both of those questions. You know, Noah touched on this quite a bit. Um, kids are not better off with harsher penalties. They're much more likely to be arrested again. They're much more likely um, to uh, end up in the adult criminal justice system again and again. They're less likely to graduate. They'll have a trail of collateral consequences from their conviction that makes it harder for them to succeed. Now, this shouldn't really be surprising to us that harsh responses don't really work for teenagers. I really want the people listening today to think about how little you yourself know about the particulars of the Indiana Criminal Code. Um, officer and, and uh, Joel, you're exempted from that because I think you know quite a lot. But what did you know about your state's criminal code when you were a 15 year old high school sophomore? And what difference did it make whether the penalty was twice as high or, or, or half? That's just not the way that teenagers 
are thinking. More, moreover, um, they think they're going to get away with whatever they're doing. So harsher penalties aren't going to have any impact there. Um, overwhelmingly, people age out of their offending. Um, we touched a little bit, Officer Peterson did, about teenage brains. And the development research shows that by one's mid-20s, that, that a lot of that decision-making gets better. And so it's not surprising to see arrest rates and offending just plummet in one's mid-20s. The second question was about whether it's better for the community to have these harsh responses. And the answer is the same. Uh, communities are not better off with harsh sanctions. Uh, treating a teenager as if he were an adult doesn't prevent him from offending again. And there's all sorts of great experiments that can happen around the country because we have 50 states and there's state borders and state laws change all the time. So there was a study that looked at the New York, New Jersey border, looking at kids in northern New Jersey versus kids on the other side of the Hudson River. Because until recently, New York routinely charged 16-year-olds, regardless of the offense, as if they were adults and sent them to criminal courts. And we saw that in New York, those young people charged as if they were adults were more likely to offend than the kids in northern New Jersey. That sort of uh, data shows up again and again. And so it's not better off for the community to send kids into the adult system than the juvenile system. All great points, Josh. And if I could just add to that briefly. Uh, so in Indiana, the majority of kids that are ending up in the adult system are ending up there by virtue of what we call direct file, being the prosecutors making the decision on which kids belong in adult court, not based upon an individualized assessment of that kid, his family, the environment that the kid is in, uh, you know, what the kid's history is, but based upon the elements of the offense that the kid committed in that decision alone. And if those elements meet this charging decision, then that kid is placed into adult court through something called direct file. Um, other places call that legislative transfer. Um, and so no judge is, is reviewing that decision to see, is this really the right individual for the adult court system? Is there a better way that we could reach this kid through the juvenile justice system to actually use some of those therapeutic interventions that Noah was talking about to uh, get a better outcome, not just for the kid, but for the community, because that kid might become a citizen that's very productive someday and help out you know, the community as a whole. Um, with that said, only about 40% of the kids that we're pushing into the adult court system are actually getting prison time through the system. And so that's good that 60% aren't getting prison time, but these are all kids who are going to be straddled with felony convictions. Most of these kids are you know, either pleading guilty to something or being convicted of something. And so, if they weren't, you know, so irreparable or so, you know, problematic that they actually deserve to go to prison in order to protect the society from them, why are we saddling somebody who is 16, 17 years old with a felony conviction that's going to chase them for the rest of their lives? It's a great, a great question there, Joel. Um, building off of that point, uh, Indiana did pass a law recently that um, prohibited young people who are convicted uh, as adults to be held in, you know, adult prisons. Um, however, kids that are currently being charged pretrial in the adult system can still be held in, in local jails. Um, now, for, the, for those of us who work in juvenile justice policy, uh, might be aware that um, uh, under the Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention Act reauthorization, uh, states that want to get Title II funding have to uh, be in compliance with federal law, which now prohibits, um, except for a few exceptional cases in which it would actually be in the youth's best interest, um, or keeping them in adult jails pre-trial. Um, besides the obvious funding implications, losing out on those Title II dollars, what are other reasons for why uh, young people charged as adults shouldn't be held in? Uh, adult facilities? Well, I'll start with that if I can, even though I just got done talking. Uh, so we recently had a public defender reach out to us who was needing help to prepare for a sentencing hearing for a, a young girl in Southern Indiana, smaller community, 
who had been direct filed into adult court. Uh, she had an IEP, multiple mental health diagnoses, a very um, difficult family life that she had come from. And yet, because she was pushed into that adult system through direct file and then housed in a county jail pending pretrial, despite the fact of having an IEP and ultimately receiving a very short prison sentence, so she's going to be back out in the community, she went for over a year without any kind of education, without adequate mental health services, and without therapeutic interventions that if we had started those right away by keeping her in the juvenile system, because we, we could have started some of these evaluations at least, and maybe even some therapeutic uh, interventions even before she was adjudicated in the juvenile system, but that was all delayed. Her life was put on hold, and now she is going to be perpetually behind by this whole experience not to, you know, add in the fact that just being in a county jail with adults as a child certainly was a traumatic experience in and of itself that's going to follow her for the rest of her life. So those are those are very key things that are, you know, are not key, but very impactful things that we're visiting upon some of these children that it's just the right thing to do to get these kids out of the county jail and get them in a, an appropriate setting where their needs can be met um, in something that's at, you know, more appropriate for an adolescent. Thank you, Josh. <laughs> Yeah, boy, Joel, that, that was a great story, and I'm sorry to hear it about that, that young woman. The, the data tell a very interesting story here, because the reform that we're talking about, about taking kids out of the adult jails, is not a radical change. There's about half as many kids, actually fewer than half as many kids, in adult jails as there were 10 years ago. Um, that data is from 2018. We don't have anything more recent than that. And I'm guessing that the trends will only continue year after year because taking kids out of the adult jails has not had any impact on increases in offending. So I expect that we'll continue to see a drop. This isn't a radical change being considered. As you said, um, already, uh, we're not, not holding uh, kids in the adult prison, so this is about not holding them pre-sentencing in the adult jails. And you look at the groups that support this, and you know it's radical left-wing organizations like the National Sheriffs Association and the major cities' chief of police and the National Juvenile Justice Administrators, the American Jail Association. These are the groups that are supportive of the reform of taking kids out of the adult jails for many different reasons. Stepping back and looking specifically at Indiana, now you have 94 counties there, I believe. Uh, 44 of them charged zero youth as if they were adults over the last two years. 16 counties charged one youth over the last two years, and six more charged uh, two over two years. You'll do the math and see two over two years as one per year. In other words, over the last two years, two thirds of the counties in Indiana charged one or fewer kids per year as if they were an adult, charge them. So the impact of this is really gonna be focused on a handful of counties that have the capacity in their juvenile detention facilities to connect the kids with the services they need instead of the situation that Joel was talking about of interrupting the education, interrupting um, so much by sending a kid to an adult facility instead of a juvenile facility that is much more equipped to help them. And you know, one more thing with those statistics, those numbers, what we see happening in these smaller counties that don't have very many kids going into the system, when they're held in the county jail, they are, a de facto in isolation because they have to be kept away from the adult inmates in order for their own protection. And so oftentimes they're spending 22, 23 hours a day by themselves, one hour out where they're interacting with jail staff. And it's completely devoid of any appropriate peer interaction. I could just add one thing, because thank you, Joel. You can also see how crazy expensive that is to give that sort of attention. And there is a moral case to be made 
and I think Joel just made it, but this is an incredibly inefficient use of taxpayer dollars to be separating a kid, the one kid who is in this facility, when there is another facility nearby that is much more equipped to actually help the kid provide what is needed. That also has locked doors, I should mention. Thank you. Now, uh, switching kind of to the other side of the spectrum, Indiana and other states across the country, uh, both before COVID and, and currently, have done a lot of work to reduce their youth detention numbers um, and, and really think about uh, the benefits and potential problems of, use, of using youth detention as it currently stands. Um, uh, Noah, would you mind speaking to some of the efforts Pew has done in, in states across the nation and, and thinking through where we can reduce youth detention, both during and, and following COVID? Sure, yeah. Thanks, Emily. Uh, so again, our, our project sort of provides staffing to interbranch, intergovernmental uh, working groups established by state leadership that want to take a look at these issues. And those are often led by legislators who uh, tend to take the big picture view what's happening globally, what are we investing in our system, where are we investing it, and is that in line with the research, what kind of return are we getting on that for young people, for communities, uh, for the safety of the public. And so um, our project has worked with a number of states, um, you know, uh, near Indiana, for example, uh, we worked at the request of Governor Brownback and the legislature and the Chief Justice in Kansas uh, several years ago. And Kansas's data revealed that most of their uh, taxpayer resources were focused on out-of-home placement. Uh, they had youth in facilities who had not committed a serious offense, um, who did not have a history of serious offending, um, and who stakeholders like even judges, but also staff at facilities said, we really need to be addressing these youth in their communities. Um, they heard from judges at the same time, judges and probation officers who said, we really don't have um, an array of options available. Um, we want to divert cases, for example. We don't have that. We don't have interventions that will work with the family. Um, and so Kansas looked globally at this and also felt that uh, because of the cost and because of the research showing the really poor outcomes from one place for youth, that they would put some guidelines and, and criteria in place for who could be removed from home um, and then capture that into a fund established by the legislature to make sure those dollars remain in the system or remain going back into um, in-home interventions for young people that are more effective. So uh, it was a large bill. It passed uh, unanimously in the Senate and with about four votes in opposition in the House. Uh, it included a number of reforms. You were asking specifically about secure detention, Emily. Um, in terms of detention, it eliminated the use of secure detention for status offenses under any conditions. So status offenses are truancy, running away from home, um, other other issues that would not be in a crime for an adult. Um, it's, no, it's not all against the law in Kansas to use detention because of the poor outcomes in the research for those types of youth. Um, it really focused, it limited the use of uh, confinement in general for technical violations of probation that are not a new crime. So not just uh, short-term detention as a response, but also a longer-term commitment to the state's facilities. Uh, this The stakeholders in Kansas and legislature said really want to reserve those facilities for youth that have committed a serious crime and not youth that are simply violating an order um, of the court or missing a curfew and the like. Um, in terms of detention, again, the law constricts the overall use of detention to focus on the most serious person felonies, uh, limiting pre and post disposition detention to a cumulative number of uh, days, 45 days over the course of a case. And it sort of incentivizes the system, incentivizes judges or probation officers to use detention um, more judiciously and to really make sure it's used, being used in, in severe situations um, to get you know, a cap there. So um, a couple of the provisions in that law, a lot of this information is available on, on our website and, and also in Kansas's websites, they have a lot of annual reports on this stuff. Um, I also just wanted to briefly cite um, work that Kentucky did um, passing legislation in 2014. Um, our project provided some data staffing. They also were seeing that a big driver of their out-of-home population was not very serious offenses, not youth with a, a deep history of offending um, or who presented as the most serious cases, but the types of youth that, in the view of research, really are, are best addressed either through um, intensive probation or even through diversion in a lot of cases. Um, so in terms of uh, commitment in Kentucky, really they focused, um, they committed, they prohibited placement 
uh, for misdemeanors and class D felonies, unless the youth's been adjudicated with a deadly weapon or an offense that would classify them as a sex offender, or unless they've got three or more prior adjudications uh, or supervision violations. So sort of limiting it in the law um, and capturing those savings for reinvestment. Uh, I think also with regard to detention, uh, requires the use of graduated in incentives and, and sanctions to uh, encourage compliance with supervision um, and permits detention, but only up to 30 days. Uh, Kentucky also prohibits in law um, that youth may not be committed or recommitted to the state custody uh, for a violation of probation. It needs to be a new offense and they need to be charged and, and go through that process from the start. So uh, these states did a lot on a lot of, in a lot of areas, but I, I do think um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of those uh, statistics because you all are, are so close to them and, and there may be leaders that you could reach out to and be in touch with. Um, the sponsor of that bill in Kentucky who is also the chair of uh, the committee that put together the recommendations and is now the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, Senator Whitney Westerfield. He said of this law, quote, we can no longer pour money into a system that produces such disappointing results for taxpayers and for our young people. These reforms will create more effective, fiscally sensible approach to how we manage youth in Kentucky whose lives are veering off track. So um, I say that just to say that these leaders are still active and implementing these laws and involved in the system. And so the degree that uh, any of you are working with legislative changes, I would encourage you to reach out to those leaders as well. Thank you, Noah. Judge Morris, I'm so glad we could have you on. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Thank um, you, no, it's my fault, but <laughs> thank you. Wait, I, at this point, we can just blame Zoom. Their stock shares are doing perfectly fine. Um, but Judge Morris, could you speak to a little bit about Indiana's efforts through JDEI, uh, the Juvenile Detentions Alternatives Initiative, to reduce some of the detention populations and why that's a goal that you've you know, been a part of? Well, thank you, um, Emily, and I'm pleased to be a part of this. Uh, I, it, detention, I, I will tell you what the impetus was. When I arrived at juvenile court 15 years ago as a brand new baby judge, we uh, had a 144 bed detention center that regularly had over 200 kids in it. Some of them as young as eight, eight, that's a second grader. So we searched around to really try to find something um, that would guide us. And we found the Annie E. Casey's Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative, JDAI, who have sites across the country. And admittedly, we kind of stalked them and said, please, please, we want to be a part of this. Um, and we have been, um, it, it's a very evidence-based uh, approach and um, takes a lot of the subjectivity out of the decision to detain kids and really looks at um, objective factors that actually should or should not indicate whether a child should be detained. Um, and we have, the, um, Marion County's been a site since 2006, um, and it has been just a mind blowing and mind changing experience. It taught us um, uh, really that we didn't need to detain nearly as many kids. And uh, we have twice dropped the cap on our detention center. And with the COVID situation, uh, we are having um, sometimes less than 20 children in detention. Um, it, it has just been a, uh, with no resultant juvenile crime way. Um, that is how we validated the instrument. Not only did it show that children would show up for court and that they uh, were not a danger to the community, but that um, uh, we could really um, reduce the population. And word leaked out about what we were doing in Marion County and um, uh, several other counties wanted to become a part. And now it is, um, uh, a statewide effort. I would, I think that about 60% of the counties are now JDAI sites. Um, and um, it is administered at a state level. Um, and the whole state is committed to reducing these detention efforts uh, uh, needs. And it has just really informed our practice. Wait a minute, why are we doing stuff anecdotally when it should be evidence based? What a crazy concept, right? <laughs> Turns out it works. Um, so it, it, it has been a really heartwarming journey. 
Um, we have involved lots of our community partners to help us really guide the way and what things were important for the community, what things were important for the courts, for the police, for the, the detention center, for um, really all the stakeholders, the people that, that we all deal with every day. Um, it's been a great thing. I recommend it to anyone. I'm so glad to hear you speak so positively about uh, JDAI and how that's been going in Indiana. Um, I'm curious, uh, Indiana currently doesn't have a minimum age of detention. Can you speak a little bit more about what detention would used to look like for an eight, you know, a, a young person as young as eight or, or nine in the system? Um, it didn't last very long because when I saw a second grader, um, I just really flipped out. Um, it, it, it was, um, they had a separate place for the younger children and they had tutors and all kinds of things. But th there honestly was no reason for these children to be out of their home. Or at, at, even if they needed to be out of the home, detention certainly was not the correct placement for these children. Um, things might not have been good at home, but there are relatives, there are uh, kinship care providers, other people that that child is connected to um, that can serve as um, a place where that child feels comfortable. And what kind of a crime can an eight-year-old commit for crying out loud? These are people that still believe, these are kids that believe in the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus. Why in the world would we detain an eight-year-old? It, it, it gives me shivers to think about it now. It was not a good program. I could jump in, Judge. Uh, it's all right. I, 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 we were speaking earlier about research very sort of broadly about what works for, for uh, juvenile justice and, and getting the best outcomes. But um, just to support, not, not just uh, detention uh, stays to support uh, sort of reducing them for younger children, but also uh, even looking at the most serious cases. Um, there's been some really strong research showing very strong correlations between stays and detention and um, lower educational outcomes. And also, uh, as Josh was saying, much, much um, worse recidivism. Obviously, exactly. these youth are not going uh, for 10, 20 years. They're coming back to the community. Um, so economists from MIT and Brown did a recent study, I'd be happy to share, uh, where they looked at 35,000 Illinois youth over 10 years. So that's a pretty wide swath. That's your younger kids, your older kids, your most serious kids. Um, and it found that use of detention lowered the likelihood of high school graduation by 13 percentage points um, and also increased the likelihood of adult incarceration by 23 percentage points. So just wanted to underline that there's quite a lot of research um, supporting some of what the judge mentioned. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. Um, Officer Peterson, in, in your current role and in your previous role, you had the opportunity to kind of lead restorative justice conferencing with young people in the school system, which um, for those who might not be familiar with restorative justice, focuses on uh, both a, a young person who was charged with a crime or, or, you know, did some sort of harm, as well as bringing them together with the person that was harmed to, to talk about what happened and to talk about what a joint uh, a collaborative path going forward looks like to repair that harm. Um, and could you speak a little bit more about what that looked like in your experience and how young people um, who normally don't get that sort of interaction in a, in a formal justice intervention, um, how that, what did that experience was like for them? Uh, first, I would like to say, it, I think it was Judge Moore's uh, bringing to the light of our police legitimacy in school uh, because uh, we did have schools that were arresting seven and eight year, you know, eight year, uh, year old kids. I mean, eight, you know, babies. And so we had to kind of uh, look at our police legitimacy and we had to go back and realize that, uh, that the, the power of our police uh, to fulfill our functions and duties were deeply dependent upon public approval. And so parents weren't happy with what we were doing. The community wasn't happy. Uh, to see how uh, the young kids were being treated. So we had to go back and reinvent a system to say, not reinvent it, but relook at it and say, are we doing things in the best interest of children? So we had to go back and look at school discipline files and how the school was disciplined kids mm -hmm. and were school police officers being called in to discipline kids that were not criminal or crime related activities. So we had to go in and say, is this disorder disruptive or is it criminal? 
And we are, had to back off and allow administrators to handle that part of their school discipline and, and stop getting so much involved uh, and I'm gonna say disproportionate contact with youth there was increasing the likelihood that a kid would be arrested for something like disorderly conduct, which I don't believe even, even really exists uh, at that age. But uh, so we had to go back and we had to relook at what we were doing. So yes, restorative justice was, was, was one of those things that uh, became paramount uh, in how we were dealing with kids. We were holding uh, just like check-ins with kids. Uh, our officers were trained to, to greet kids, to try to establish relationships with our students. So our students knew us and we knew them. Uh, we could tell by, you know, just the look on a kid's face uh, if something was you know, afoot. Uh, and so we could have what we call restorative conversations and talk to the kid and then re uh, refer them to that appropriate resource or that counselor or that teacher for some additional, uh, I would say, support. So when we sell the kid in that, in that in the calm phase, and then we saw kids that were starting to trigger in behavior and acting out, we, uh, we allowed the, the staff to intervene quicker uh, instead of the police doing it. But the, the best part was the de-escalation skills that our officers started to begin to, uh, to, to, uh, to get. And that was basically taking a step back and then realizing that, okay, uh, there are some adverse childhood experiences. What is causing this type of behavior and these types of outcomes that we're seeing. And why is the police so involved in this and in such an early state of the acting out cycle? And so we backed off of it. We had legitimate impromptu conferences through restorative justice. Uh, I've practiced, like I said, uh, restorative justice conferences um, with, with kids who have, crit, um, I'm gonna say, who have committed just minor crimes, a fight in the, in the cafeteria where I've seen officers arrest a kid for battery, uh, whereas we could do restorative justice conferences instead of the kid getting a criminal record. Uh, you know, we get all the parties involved. We were able to sit down, uh, get stakeholders involved, get the parents involved, and sit around and have this, this restorative justice conference. And so uh, the, kid, I mean, the kid was able to, I'm going to say, gain the one thing I think most of our kids are lacking today is empathy. And so they were able to empathize with how their behavior affected so many people just because they weren't thinking in the right state. So, and then the, the victim, without re-victimizing the victim that agreed to the conference, uh, felt like they had some input into the conference. And so they felt more empowered now to be able to sit down in, in a safe environment and explain, this is how this made me feel. And so, uh, so it's been a, a very helpful tool that we have used to reduce the amount of uh, kids that we're actually I'm going to say arresting in, in school systems. Judge Morris, did you want to jump in there? Was that a finger for? <laughs> oh, you're on mute right now. Judge Morris, um, you're still muted. There you go. I'm sorry. I'm good. Um, we, in, in our work, as we started JDAI, schools were an integral part of what we had to address because, and, and it took a while for me to understand why there was this huge, just floodgate of charges from schools. And uh, looking back, we kind of researched it and it dated from Columbine that suddenly adults were scared and so of horrible outcomes. And so the prosecutor, the juvenile judge had all made issued a press statement saying schools we will support you in any charges indiana is kind of unique because it requires that the uh, juvenile judge in order for a delinquency charge to be filed against a child the the juvenile judge has to find that it is in the there's probable cause obviously and that it is in the best interest of the community and of the child and so we met with schools and said, we're not going to be, be approving petitions anymore for things like uh, a simple battery. If there's blood, if someone's seriously injured, of course, that's a separate situation. But for a kid who um, curses at a teacher and says, I'm going to F and kill you, that is not a deep felony intimidation charge. That's a kid being a kid. And we cannot criminalize that kind of behavior because there are consequences. The days of a juvenile record being completely 
sealed and um, not being accessed by the adult system are over. Those records are used and have deep and serious con uh, it, um, considerations for these kids. So we met with the schools and, and they did a, a, a decent job, and, but we kept seeing creep. It was coming back. And so we issued a letter to the schools that said, you may not even bring these children to detention because in many cases, they didn't want to criminally charge them. They just wanted to solve the problem of the behavior in the school. And detention is not an appropriate place for that. So we work to help develop uh, solutions with people like um, Officer Peterson and so that things could be dealt with at the school level and that they wouldn't become um, delinquency charges against a child. Uh, it, it, the schools had a cap for a little while, and, and, but we worked through it and it has been a really positive uh, partnership that we've developed. And um, each of the school systems does something different um, with kids that, that they're maintaining, but it does involve working with the families, the, the community, the children, not the, the juvenile justice system. And Judge Moore, is that, uh, and folks, attendees, feel free to submit your questions uh, either through the chat box um, to the panelists or, or, or to everybody. Um, that hits on one of the questions that one of our attendees had, which is, uh, can you, there's been a trend and certainly a more deserved news coverage of the link between schools and, and black young women, particularly entering the juvenile justice system. Uh, what has that looked like in Indiana and, and how, do, how do some of these policies maybe help to reverse that trend? Um, and where can we still go from there to make sure that's not happening? One of the areas where we have seen young um, African-American women coming into our system is from having been trafficked. Um, a, a terrible and terrifying trend that, that we're seeing. Um, young women who are unhappy at home because they have a cruddy home and um, are, are very vulnerable to those who wish to traffic them. Um, and uh, that has been, um, we've had to develop very specific resources to assist those young women. Um, but I, I've gotta be honest that in other than that specialized area, I don't think that we do a good job for uh, young women in general and specifically young African-American uh, women who are coming into the system through a delinquency. Thank you for that honest assessment, Judge Morris. Um, to give, no, we only have a couple of minutes left, 15 minutes. So uh, Josh, you've looked a lot about how, uh, looked into how COVID and just pandemic responses have changed juvenile detention populations and juvenile justice policy. Uh, in some ways for, for the better perhaps as detention populations uh, decrease and in some ways pot potentially for the worse as folks look at state budget cuts. Uh, what, what really is the opportunity for juvenile justice reform uh, in 2021 and, and the end of this year to the extent legislators are still open? You know, I'm hearing something really wonderful from Judge Morris that, that I've heard elsewhere also, which is that detention populations are way down. And there's two big reasons why that's happened. One is intentional decisions to detain fewer kids. And the other is that, you know, that a lot of the avenues that send kids into the courts are closed. You know, it's a lot harder to get into trouble when, you know, you're home with your parents and they're hovering over you all the time. It's a lot harder to shoplift when the stores are closed or half empty because there's not as many people there. The drug markets have been interrupted in the same way that other markets have been interrupted, which means arrests for drug possession are down. So we've definitely seen a decline in youth arrests on the one hand, which funnels fewer kids into the courts and fewer kids into the detention centers, and then active decisions to detain fewer kids because so many kids were being detained on low level charges. And I think that a lot of us reformers hope that this is a new normal, that detention is going to be reserved only for the most serious cases and only when there's no alternative available. You know, I think those are reforms that Pew has done a great job highlighting of the idea of detaining kids for breaking the terms of their probation when the probation may be violation, may be skipping school or maybe failing a drug test. 
that's not a reason to send a kid to a detention center. It's a reason to figure out why the kid's not going to school. So I'm largely optimistic about what we've seen in the declines in incarceration populations. And I hope that those lessons stick, that we don't need to be using detention, we don't need to be using commitment when there's so many opportunities to serve kids in need in their communities instead. Yeah, can, I, can I add something to that real quick? Um, and we talk about low level uh, offenses uh, uh, here in Indiana. And this is one of the things that uh, Judge Moore's really stressed to us is, you know, you, if we, even if we get a say misdemeanor battery charge, uh, we can still do the proper, uh, the proper documentation. We get all the information from the school. If a kid's got an IEP or individual education plan or behavior improvement plan, we get all of those documents. We get all of the kids, uh, say, uh, school discipline files. We take all of that stuff and submit it to our juvenile probation people to review. And we go back to that same principle. Uh, we're not trying to be punitive, but how can we support? What, what services will this kid need uh, from the juvenile justice system to, I would say, improve the outcome? So it's not about the arresting of the kid. It's about how can we better support that youth in the, in the, I'm going to say in the challenges that they may have. Uh, so we still use that and we do that also with restorative justice. So we can defer that to restorative justice to give a kid a chance uh, to, I'm going to say, to redeem himself or a second chance. And then, uh, and then we can process the paperwork through, uh, through the system that way. And if the juvenile, this, the probation people decide, you know what, uh, we still want to see him in court then they can issue a warrant for him or whatever they want to do. And that kid can be picked up and, and transported. At least they don't spend a, a night or a day or two in jail or juvenile detention just because of a little fight that they had in the cafeteria. Just because you'd, you'd asked a question um, earlier about COVID-19 and the response to the pandemic and, and the data that Josh has kept on that. I thought I would just pipe in. I think I may have de-emphasized this a little bit because there's there's so much research to highlight. But one other consideration that I would expect legislators in Indiana may be uh, considering in the coming year are um, you know, fiscal issues related to um, you know the tragedy of this pandemic and and the economic implications of it. Um, in states where we provided technical assistance, legislators who have led on juvenile justice have asked some key questions. They've asked how much is the state spending on the juvenile justice system across the whole range from Officer Peterson's interventions all the way through the back end or youth who are transferred. Um, and then where are those resources focused? Are they focused on placement? Um, are they focused on a continuum of options for judges for moderate or high-risk youth? Are they focused on diversion in schools or other resources there? Um, and then once they get answers to those questions, what does what research say about what's most effective? Um, in the case of a few of these issues you've been talking about, like detention, there's a real alignment between uh, the fiscal incentives to try to reduce that population and also the research about what's most effective at keeping communities safe. And so I, I would just encourage folks in Indiana to ask those questions and to actually get that information from your, your system stakeholders and then to ask some of those tough questions. We find legislators just have a real sense for um, the big picture and also obviously the, the fiscal considerations. Um, in a lot of these states, the legislature has put in place some um, criteria or limitations in some, some areas, but they've also put in some upfront funding. In Kansas, there was about 2 million attached to their initial uh, legislation. That expanded functional family therapy, which is an evidence-based intervention uh, to every region of Kansas in the first year through regionalized state contracts. Um, but since that time, Kansas has reduced its out-of-home population by 60 some uh, percent, and those dollars are captured in the fund. And so the savings that the state has realized into that fund are, I think, in the range of 30 or 40 million at this point. And that's, those are dollars that can go back into interventions to support uh, interventions in schools or interventions for diversion or, or resources the judges need. So I just want to put a plug in to ask some of those questions now as you're dealing with some fiscal issues related to the pandemic. Thank you, Noah. You actually uh, took the words right out of my mouth because I was going to ask uh, what our panelists would, would say if they could say one thing to legislators looking into the next session that are faced with these fiscal constraints and also faced with a wonderful overview of the evidence around some of the potential issues with whether it's charging young people as adults or keeping them adult facilities or keeping them in detention facilities for a couple of days when that's not really aligned with 
what's best for them in their case. Um, so to pose that to the rest of our panelists, if, what, what would you say uh, to legislators or to policy advocates who are on uh, watching this webinar, what would be your advice for how to best reform the system in 2021? Um, I, this is what I noticed uh, as a law enforcement officer, I'm a, a, a Indiana Law Enforcement Training Board certified instructor. Uh, every police officer goes through the police academy. There is no training offered on juvenile justice systems and policies and procedures. Everything's done on adult level. And so officers, if, we, if, if I was speaking to a legislator now, I would say, can we look at our state academies and say, you know what, instead of the 36 weeks, maybe we need to add four, five, six more weeks to our police academy training where officers can at one place get the same training, the same knowledge, and, and be able to roll that out to all the departments across the state of Indiana where we are trained on juvenile brain development and behaviors and IEPs and BIPs. And we need to understand that in order to be better officers and serve our community in a better and more productive way. Um, I would say, I, I echo what um, Officer Peterson said. It is, um, we have been very fortunate that uh, on a smaller scale, not what Kansas is doing, but still that the legislators have been able to help us repurpose the money that has um, been used for detention that's no longer necessary to fund alternatives, supports for families, other things. Um, and it, it, it's the dollars and cents of this are uh, unequivocal and are um, uh, dramatic in terms of front loading the system instead of throwing all the resources at the end. Uh, we've dramatically reduced the populations in the uh, Indiana Department of Corrections for Youth. We have um, dramatically dropped the uh, number of children that are placed out of home. Is there work to be done? Absolutely. And um, I think that we could do a lot by reforming and revising our juvenile code, which it stem, it was written in 1974 and has only been piecemeal amended so that it reflects things that we now know about uh, uh, adolescent brain development, or more importantly, the lack of adolescent <laughs> brain development <laughs> and um, and how to factor that in. And I couldn't agree more with Officer Peterson about the training for law enforcement. We have used on a small scale for folks in Marion County, which is the Indianapolis um, area, uh, called Policing the Teen Brain, about helping officers understand when you roll up on a, uh, a group of kids, why they run. Um, and understanding the different responses and how those play into um, the fact that these kids are limbically challenged and not, you know, they don't have a developed prefrontal cortex. Thank you, Josh. It looks like you have your mic, your mic ready to go. Yeah, you know, I, I love what I'm hearing from uh, from Officer Peterson and, and Judge Moore, you know, I think the main takeaway from this, and it was something that you started with, is understanding that kids are kids. They're not little adults. And, you know, it can be hard to believe when you're playing basketball with your 15-year-old nephew who's suddenly taller than you and pummeling you in, in backyard in driveway basketball that his his brain is the brain of a teenager that's got a long way to go, even if he's gotten taller than you. You know, it, I think it's kind of important to recognize the ways that our own biases can look at a kid and not see, you know, the child that's inside there, especially when we're talking about youth of color. There was an amazing study that was done that uh, asked adults to guess the ages of kids, a bunch of kids who'd been charged with felonies, and looked at the African-American youth and guessed that they were four and a half years older than they actually were and looked at the white kids who had been accused of felonies and guessed that they were a year younger than they actually were. What that means is that, that for most of us, people like myself might look at an eighth grader, an African-American eighth grader, and assume that he's 18 years old because of the trouble that he's in. 
but he's not 18 years old. And we need a response that is appropriate to where he is in life and to try to get him back on the right track. It's going to be better for the kid. And most of all, it's going to be better for the community as a whole. Thank you, Josh. Joel? And since I am uh, going towards the back end, I get to talk about the intersection of the concepts that we were just talked about. I see opportunities that are created by the reduction in our juvenile detention populations. And that is related directly to our adolescent development understanding that's ever expanding. We need to be pulling more of these kids that are being pushed into the adult court system back into the juvenile system. And if they truly are the kids that pose a danger to themselves or society, we have a way to deal with that in these facilities that now have open spaces. Um, and I think while we're dealing with them in these juvenile systems, we can also start using the therapeutic interventions, minimize the consequences so they're appropriate, an appropriate fit for the child, and it doesn't saddle them with a felony conviction that's going to be chasing them for the rest of their life and keeping them from being a productive citizen and taxpayer, father, whatever it might be. Um, and so we have some great opportunities here, and I like where we're headed, but we do need some legal changes. And I think the direct file system uh, needs to go because it's, it doesn't take into account the individual circumstances and the adolescent development piece for these kids. We need to have a judge make that decision as to which kid belongs in the adult system and which kid can be rehabilitated in the juvenile system. And I think we're gonna see long-term benefits in our society. Well, thank you everyone. I'll uh, kick it off to Jesse for wrapping up, but this was a fabulous panel. I certainly feel like I learned a lot just from listening to everyone's responses. Um, and thank you so much for being there. Yes, again, I will echo Emily's words of thanks to all of our panelists and our attendees. If you'd like more information on R Street, you can check us out at rstreet.org. I will also note that this event was recorded. So if you have any colleagues that you think would benefit from hearing our stories and our opinions, please let me know and I can send you a link and we can get it distributed more broadly. Again, thank you all so, so much and I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Thanks.